Wednesday marks the 18th anniversary of Macau's return to China as China envisages a greater integration between the region and the mainland together with Hong Kong. What opportunities and challenges is Macau faced with? And Beijing is expected to start relocating its municipal political organs to a suburb. How will this move reshape the DNA of the capital? This is The Point, live from Beijing, I'm Li Xin. Twenty seventeen marks the eighteenth anniversary of Macau's return to China. On Wednesday, the Macau Special Administrative Regional Government and the People's Liberation Army troops stationed in Macau held a flag raising ceremony to celebrate the anniversary. In its speech to the reception held by the SAR government, Chief Executive Choi Sai On thanked the central government for their support and reiterated the SAR government's adherence to the principle of one country, two systems. Choi also announced that the port management zone on the Macau side of a bridge linking Macau, Hong Kong and the mainland has been completed and is open to traffic. As the central government is boosting the economic and social integration of these three areas under a new initiative called the Greater Bay Area, what opportunities are in store for Macau? And as a platform for connecting China with Portuguese-speaking countries, how important is Macau in the Belt and Road Initiative? Joining me for the discussion from Hong Kong is Robert Kep, Director of the Economist Corporate Network, and from Shanghai, Shen Ding Li, Professor of International Relations at Fudan University. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Professor Shen, now the chief executive of the Macau SAR government, Trey Sion, reiterated on Wednesday that uh, the SAR government will continue to adhere to the principle of one country, two systems. How would you describe the connection between the SAR government and the central government and between the peoples on the, on the both sides since the, uh, uh, the 18 years that Hong Kong has returned to China? Well, uh, ever since Macau has been reverted to the main, mainland China, uh, people in Macau seem to be uh, uh, quite happy. Uh, the expectation to a better life and a, a better income has been satisfied. Uh, Macau's economic uh, per capita income and GDP has been rising rapidly. Uh, it has surpassed uh, that of Hong Kong and I think it has been more than doubled uh, than that of Hong Kong. So this uh, makes uh, Macau people uh, relatively happier and uh, they think uh, their uh, uh, distance, uh, not a geographical distance, but a psychological distance with mainland has been uh, closer. Mm -hmm. um, Rob, observing from Hong Kong, how are people in Hong Kong looking at this better relationship between Macau, the neighbor, with the central government? Well, I don't think it's something that necessarily uh, occupies the attention of people in Hong Kong so much. I mean, they do pay some attention to it, but they have a different set of parameters. Uh, as the professor was just mentioning, you know, uh, Macau has been prospering under uh, direct rule uh, from uh, mainland China. It's not that uh, Hong Kong hasn't been, but uh, Macau's economy is far more dependent on visitors from mainland China, particularly in the gaming or, or gambling sector. So half of Hong Kong, uh, that is Macau's GDP, uh, comes just from mainland gamblers, basically. They're not all from the mainland, but mainly from the mainland. So the dependency ratio, you could say, is much higher. So there's a much stronger feeling in Macau towards the mainland in a very positive vein, and there's some tensions here in Hong Kong that really aren't related to what's going on in Macau. Mm -hmm. Professor Shen, how do you explain the stronger sense of affinity or identity that people in Macau have towards the mainland, which have contributed to the better economic prosperity that uh, has been achieved on, uh, in the SAR government? I think uh, uh, Macau uh, noticed that uh, uh, it is a part of China and it depends upon the mainland very highly and it has to be sensible. And uh, the mainland has given lots of benefits to Macau, given a certain uh, uh, space. Recently, government, central government has given 84 uh, square kilometers uh, uh, sea region, sea area, uh, for uh, the Macau government to administer. And given part of the mainland territory uh, for Macau to use 
to expand its education base. For this, they think uh, mainland has been uh, helping Macau and they have every reason to work with the mainland uh, through the one China uh, two system uh, parameter uh, faithfully. And uh, Rob, coming back to you, I don't want to sound as if you know Macau is doing all the right things and Hong Kong people are doing all the wrong things, but objectively <laughs> speaking, do you think there is a thing or two that uh, people in Hong Kong can emulate from the Macau experience? Well, certainly in the sense of uh, how the governing authorities in Macau have found a way to deal with the mainland authorities in a manner that doesn't really upset the population. I guess you could say that would be a, a kind of benchmark. Uh, you, you have a very different set of governing officials actually in uh, Hong Kong, even those who are pro-establishment as they say or, or very much in the uh, integration camp and, and wanting to see more integration with the mainland. They've largely been trained under a British system and it's been a British system that's very well regarded and has been here uh, although not as long as Macau's system under the Portuguese, the Portuguese weren't particularly well known for their governance. They didn't really develop a diversified economy. So uh, in any case though, uh, definitely the Ma Macau authorities have been able to find a way to make the uh, new SAR administration seem a lot more in the population's interest and that's something definitely the Hong Kong officials and people as well could learn from. And uh, Professor Sheng, your take on this question, uh, how do you compare the different paths or experiences that the two SAR governments have been experiencing? Do you think there is some comparison that can be made there? Well, as uh, um, uh, my uh, colleague in Hong Kong has uh, mentioned, uh, the British uh, 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 government has, been, has administered Hong Kong for a long time and uh, lots of Hong Kong officials have been uh, trained under the British system. And uh, they noticed that uh, this is not good because Hong Kong has been colonized, but at the same time they think uh, this kind of, of, the, uh, 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 kind of uh, civilian law uh, uh, and a law of law uh, might uh, be useful for Hong Kong to continue. And they have some expectation. Like uh, uh, Macau people would have expect, would expect that they would be uh, more in independent from Portuguese. They want to be dependent upon with the mainland. Hong Kong government people may have some expectations that after 20 years of reversion, uh, they would have the so-called uh, universal suffrage. And they have their, some of them would have their own definition of universal suffrage, which is the two system formula would go ahead of the one country, but the mainland and the mainstream Hong Kong uh, people may think one country should go ahead of two systems. Right, that's Therefore, a kind there of are some sure. uh, different expectation. Sure, that's a kind of a, a and debate. That kind of expectation has not been not, has not been satisfied for those who expect such. Right, and this kind of a debate seems to be um, not reaching any kind of a conclusion or anybody is, is able to have any winning hand. Indeed, let's look at the economic opportunities that we're uh, looking at that the central government has mapped out for these two regions. Now, there is this uh, one belt and one road initiative, for instance, and the Greater Bay Area uh, initiative that I've mentioned. Macau. Uh, Professor Sheng has uh, presented its one center, one platform plan in answer to the Belt and Road Initiative. How is Macau's uh, role uh, exemplified in, in that future under the Belt and Road Initiative, Professor Sheng? Okay, because uh, the, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative mainly targets those uh, countries and regions in uh, China's western uh, area and uh, that uh, covers uh, lots of the former uh, uh, Portuguese uh, 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 road area uh, where lots of people speak Portuguese. Mm -hmm. So Hong, uh, Macau people may think they have certain uh, uh, competence because they, ha they may have some bilingual competence speaking both Chinese and uh, uh, Portuguese and with some English which can help them to tap when China would work with some Portuguese-speaking country and region uh, in bri bridging the, the sea lane and uh, the air connection. You need talents in the people, in the people who know the culture and the language. And uh, that is what uh, Macau can fill the void. Right, right, indeed. And, uh, you know, zooming 
uh, closer to the region. Actually, we have been seeing footages of this gigantic bridge that's called the Hong Kong Zhuhai Macau Bridge. And as I said in the beginning, uh, Mr. Tui said that this bridge or part of the bridge has been completed. Now, one very technical issue, uh, also symbolic as well, is the different systems that the three areas, Hong Kong, Macau, and the mainland, are adopting in terms of law, regulations, even a way to drive. So, um, Rob, how do you look at the kind of uh, compatibility problems that this, this kind of uh, integration initiative might be facing? Well, actually, those uh, differences in the systems are, are quite key. I mean, on the positive side, there's a lot of momentum towards integration. It used to be Hong Kong was by far the dominant economy in the region. It's now just as of this year been overtaken by Shenzhen. Mm -hmm. uh, Shenzhen's GDP will be one trillion U.S. dollars a year, we estimate, by 2030. So, you know, it, where Hong Kong's is about 350 billion right now and, and growing much less slowly, there's all this momentum to integrate with that uh, larger economy. However, just as you were saying, everything from driving on the left side of the road, although that can actually be solved somewhat easily just by switching lanes, uh, you have a different legal system. You have different currencies. In fact, Macau and Hong Kong both effectively have their uh, currencies pegged to the U.S. dollar. It's a freely traded currency. Uh, mainland China's renminbi is a controlled currency and uh, not as globalized as the dollar. So anyway, just all those little bits and pieces are going to be the sorts of things that will have to be gotten through in order to really achieve true integration. Right. Professor Shen, very briefly, how do you look at these differences? Do they present more of an obstacle or, you know, also a lot of opportunities as well? Uh, I think both. In addition to what uh, has been mentioned in terms of the uh, challenges, I think uh, there are also lots of opportunity. And uh, through integrating Hong Kong, Macau, the mainland, through the Pearl River uh, Delta region, uh, we have opportunity to integrate this uh, system. Uh, possibly in the future there, there will be a certain kind of a soft currency which would integrate the three. And uh, probably the diversity among the culture and the language could also offer uh, more opportunity for the mainland to, de to tap uh, the competence of Portuguese and English-speaking community. So uh, we need to take notice of both challenges and opportunities. Indeed, unprecedented uh, uh, opportunities and ideas needs very flexible and innovative solutions. We have to leave it there. Many thanks to our two guests, Rob Kep, Director of the Economist of Corporate Network, and Dr. Shen, uh, Professor Shen Ding Li of International Relations at Fudan University. And here is my first point. Uh, happy anniversary, first of all, to Macau. Now, the relationship between Macau and the mainland can be compared to a virtuous cycle. Affinity led to economic prosperity, which promoted even stronger affinity and confidence for the future. It is an example which shows that the one country, two systems formula can work if the local people are willing to embrace the opportunities instead of resisting the changes. Of course, Hong Kong is a different place with different circumstances but it could learn a lesson or two from Macau on how to adapt to and interact with the central government in order to deliver development to the local people. You're watching The Point. I'll be back right after this. Beijing will relocate its uh, municipal government to the southeastern suburban district of Tongzhou at the end of this year. That's according to a city plan. About 400,000 people will be moved, including the municipal government, the municipal committee of the Communist Party of China, the People's Congress of Beijing, and the municipal committee of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, the political advisory body. And uh, this signifies that uh, Beijing's function uh, as the 
the capital of China will be partly moved to a much less congested area of Beijing to leave more breathing room in downtown area. Meanwhile, a new zone called Xiong'an in neighboring Hebei province has been under construction since April. These two areas have been described as two wings that will alleviate the density of Beijing with its multiple functions. So how will these two wings span out and what difference could it make to the over 20 million residents of Beijing, including the foreigners who are living here. Joining me for the discussion are Sichi Zheng, Samuel Tagli, Associate Professor of Urban Development and Real Estate at MIT, and Fu Jing, Professor of Political Economy at Peking University. Welcome to both of you. Professor Fu, first, give us an idea of the reasons behind moving certain branches of the municipal government to a sub-center. Uh, why is this a priority for the government? Well, uh, at the risk of uh, oversimplification, the idea actually is very simple. Beijing has been too overcrowded. Uh, part of uh, the reason of that is uh, Beijing has very high levels of concentration of power in almost uh, uh, every uh, dimension. And Beijing, incidentally, is also uh, the home to the Beijing municipal government as well as a capital city of uh, the whole of China. So the idea to move part of the function of the Beijing municipal government is in part to uh, release uh, the congestion of uh, Beijing. But of, as you indicate, there are other moves as well. Right. So uh, help us understand here. The move to the suburb of Tongzhou is all about the municipal functions of Beijing. What about the Xiong'an new area? What's happening there? Well, the Xiong'an part is uh, a uh, part of the design to absorb uh, the non-capital uh, function of uh, the city. Beijing uh, proper. For instance? For instance, well, to clarify the non-function uh, of Beijing, it uh, probably makes sense to define the function of the capital of China. Very simple, four uh, areas. Uh, Beijing should be the center, the political center. Mm -hmm. Beijing should be uh, the cultural center. Beijing should be the center for international exchanges. And uh, Beijing should be the center of uh, science and technology and innovation. And for the rest, they are earmarked as uh, the non-capital uh, center. And they will stay in Beijing or they will be moved they will to be Xiong'an? Moved. Uh, Xiong'an, Xiong okay. okay, Professor Zheng, sorry for keeping you waiting. Now, uh, people have been complaining about the overcongestion of uh, high-quality public goods in Beijing, such as hospitals and schools. Do you think the move to Tongzhou and to Xiong'an uh, could solve the problems of these so-called urban diseases? Yes, I, I agree with Fu about what he said just now. Because of the Beijing, have so many. Uh, good resources, especially the high county local public goods, schools, hospitals. So that's one driving force of the overcrowded problem. So I did a study. So I, I, I got the data and I analyzed the data. It shows that, for example, more than 70% of the high county primary schools are concentrated in the central area now within the third ring road. However, because of population, suburbanization, only less than 30, about 30% 30 of population in this area. So it's a spatial mismatch of where people are and where, where those high county public goods are. So I think the decentralized of the functions, non-capital functions of Beijing, that, and also try to encourage people to move to other places, that depends a lot on whether we can decentralize those high county public goods. Mm -hmm. But in this regard, I think it's not just to build a school, to build a hospital in Tongzhou or Yun Xinguan, but the most important thing is to attract those um, teachers, those high quality teachers and uh, doctors to those places. I think that's a big challenge comparing to just build those uh, uh, physical buildings there. Right, indeed. Every, people have to leave everything behind to move to a, a different place as actually kind of a migrant workers. Professor Fu, do you think the Chinese government has some ideas in mind about what to do to take care of the needs of these professionals and officials? 
China uh, has uh, learning uh, the tools of the marketplace for the past uh, uh, 30 now it's uh, uh, close to 40 years uh, so we understand the power of the market but at the time we also understand uh, the the establishment here. Beijing is a city uh, where you see a lot of uh, uh, state-owned enterprises and uh, to uh, shape uh, the state of enterprises uh, towards uh, more towards market at the moment uh, administrative fiat is also a very powerful tool uh, when you go up uh, the ranks uh, you have to obey so in that sense uh, uh, probably uh, foreigners won't understand how can you uh, build another place to attract a lot of people but when you understand the nature of uh, uh, a, the shadows of uh, central planning system. Uh, we can still uh, count to a certain extent our admit, uh, administrative fiat so that for big state-owned enterprises, for universities, if universities, uh, uh, institutions of learning, uh, by the way, are mostly state-controlled. So if you design a system of rotation for teachers, uh, it's uh, feasible for them also to ro rotate. But the key is uh, somehow instead of uh, continue to uh, concentrate those forces, you need to uh, disperse uh, those uh, uh, forces. Uh, two uh, things you need to do. One is you need to build the physical infrastructure. Uh, right. That is uh, what China is good at. The other is uh, to also disperse those uh, personnel uh, to the extent that is uh, uh, feasible and in the process of the hope uh, that place will also be a good one so that it will continue to attract people. Right, it's a, it's a kind of a compromise, right, it's, uh, of your personal uh, choice but also for the choice of the country, the needs of the country. Professor Zheng, coming to you now, there have been um, international cities such as Tokyo, London, Paris, they all have sub-centers. Um, do you think it is also necessary for Beijing to have some kind of a sub-center and face out its uh, non-capital functions? Yes, I agree with this. And I think uh, every like very big city, they have sub-centers. And I think Beijing already has some sub-centers. So for example, uh, uh, Ya Yunchun and, uh, and the Zhong Guanchun, they are sub-centers uh, with different functions. And I did an empirical study that's showing that Beijing already have like 10 or more sub-centers according to the definition mm -hmm. of the sub-centers in the literature. But here I think the key is it's a market-driven sub-center or policy-driven sub-center and which one and how to make them successful uh, going forward. So market-driven sub-center is like market force in individual forms they choose to locate there and cluster together. But policy sub-center, you mean, I mean, the government just uh, assigns some favorable policies to a certain, a given location and use those policy, maybe subsidy, to attract some institutions, forms to bring there. So there are some studies on this topic, but basically the message is that for the policy driven, the key is to assign the policies to those locations with a comparative advantage for those later proposed activities. Mm -hmm. So you cannot just assign pol policy to a wrong place that will cause misallocation problem. Okay. Yeah, Professor Fu, go the, ahead. The, the, the concept of a sub-center uh, should be clarified. When we say sub-center uh, of uh, Beijing, it's a sub-center of the municipal uh, government of uh, Beijing. Uh, we need to disperse uh, part of the function of the municipal government to that area. Mm -hmm. But for the Xiong'an area, it's an area that is earmarked to absorb uh, the non-capital uh, uh, function of uh, uh, Beijing now. So but it's not a sub-capital, let's say. I think it needs to be clarified, right? We're not going to have a second political capital no. of China. It's no. just some of the non-political yeah. uh, yeah. or capital. Because you, if you look at the uh, current uh, uh, state of Beijing, uh, it's all a combination of all kinds of things. Uh, right. uh, it plays the function of a political center, uh, a cultural center, uh, I center for, I but we, for, for those we need to move that out. What, is, what does this uh, mean though for the many foreigners who are living in Beijing and who might be visiting Beijing or studying in Beijing? Uh, will their life be affected, Professor Fu? Well, for uh, 
Well, some of course will be uh, affected uh, for uh, those foreigners uh, who work for, say, firms, or is, uh, especially state-owned enterprises. Uh, there will be good chances for them to be moved to places like Xiong'an. Uh, but for uh, foreigners, if they have a chance to work for the uh, Beijing municipal government, uh, well, then to that area. For the foreign tourists or foreign, foreign visitors? Foreign tourists or visitors, they, uh, they will continue to uh, stay here. They will continue to be here and to visit uh, <laughs> uh, the sites uh, here in Beijing. Professor Zheng, your quick take on this question? Uh, yes, I think some of these uh, foreign foreign visitors will go to Xi'an or go to go to Tongzhou, for example, some universities they move their campus there. So our foreign students will move there. But for tourists, they, they will be still in, Be in Beijing because in, in central area because of the culture center and the international communication function there. Of, of course, but the city of Beijing will be different to what extent, in, in what way? You know, you, when you move all the municipal governments outside, will the city be greener, be more you know, leisure or more tourist friendly or more residential? Professor Fu, very briefly. Uh, it will be less uh, congested, uh, it will be uh, nicer for the people who are here uh, to live, hopefully. Okay, we're looking forward to that day. Many thanks to our two guests. We have to leave it there. Si Chi Zheng, Samuel Tang, Lee, Associate Professor of Urban Development and Real Estate of MIT, and Professor Fu Jing from Peking University. And now, here's my last point. It is an unprecedented endeavor and a very ambitious project for Beijing. The advantages of China's political system are that uh, it is efficient in carrying out big projects and can mobilize abundant resources during the process. Yet, the move will affect the lives of millions of people, plus change forever the face of China's capital city. How to take care of the huge amount of details to ensure a smooth transformation will be a test to governments of different levels, as well as the people of Beijing. That's all for this edition of The Point with Li Xin. Download the application called CGTN to watch our show on your mobile devices, or go to YouTube and look for CGTN The Point. Follow me on Facebook or Twitter using the handle The Point with Alex. Thanks for watching. We've got the point.